Well, hello, everybody. My name is John Barnwell. I'm here in the greater Detroit metropolitan area, and I'm here with always interesting Joe Visconti, former gubernatorial candidate in Connecticut, the president of the American Shakespeare Theater, and a award-winning uh, I forget which award, Emmy a winning, Emmy a winning uh, videographer, and a lifelong anthroposophist. And we're here for our fifth installment of Rudolf Steiner on the Grail language. And that's kind of an all encompassing subject because basically Rudolf Steiner's work could be described as the grail language and so with that how you doing there joe pretty good i'm hanging out inside almost 100 degrees over here in west hartford connecticut yesterday was warm it's getting warm i love the heat but woo, it's hot one yeah i i went out in the sun and it was like you know i was trying to do yard work i was doing it in the shade and i thought well i gotta go over here and it's like yeah it, it almost convinced me that global warming is real well, the sun used to be yellow, and it's not yellow anymore. It's white. So yeah. the sun has its own cycles, and, of course, they like to leave that out when they try to uh, calibrate their theories regarding the weather. But we don't want to go down that road. Other people do a much better job than I. But we've been having an interesting dialogue uh, Joe and myself as of late, and the great question you can ask your materialist uh, devotees of scientism. So tell me, how do you store memories in your brain? That's, you know, it was about a month or two ago it dawned on me, and I know it happened a few years ago, but I had an epiphany, well, wait a minute, all that I know and I study through anthroposophy. I'm not a neuro neuroscientist, but I'm like, wait a second. I, I do have a degree in electronic technology from uh, the University of Hartford and, um, and did a lot of work in electronics and electricity. And I said to myself, wait a minute, if we take that gray matter and the synapses, et cetera, of your brain, and we put it under a micron scope, uh, are we going to see any like magnified, like monolithic digital uh, circuitry? Uh, where exactly and how um, our smells, sounds, and something that would collectively at our age, in our 60s, early 70s, would amount to like, I don't know, 300 trillion tetra bytes of information with sound, smell, which computers can't even record, recall, memory, emotion, touch, uh, blah, blah, blah. Wick, where? Where's that? How's that stored in gray matter? Or in any of, you know, if you just wanted to put it under a microscope, what would you see? That kind of came to me in one big image. And then I started talking with you. I'm like, wait a second. We we should have known this, but we didn't. We're so into anthroposophy. Sometimes we don't look towards what science is fabricating. And uh, and then you send that fantastic video. I'd love you to describe on the 10 uh, elements of science propaganda. Yeah, the, the uh, TED Talk that actually was removed by TED Talks because it was uh, Rupert Sheldrake uh, was criticizing modern science. Of course, we should call it scientism because scientism is the, the fabricated version of what they want you to think is going on. And uh, so he did a wonderful job and you can find there's a version of that. Uh, somebody re-uploaded it on uh, YouTube. So look up Rupert Sheldon. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he's a he's a remarkable guy. We used to sell his books at the bookstore, but still do, I'm sure, but I'm not there. But at the bookstore, uh, he had that whole concept of the morphic fields. And part of the challenge with some of these people 
that are transitional, like Rupert Sheldrake. He almost gets there, you know, because when you get into Rudolf Steiner's work, Rudolf Steiner is always talking about how the manifest world is the act, the deeds of multitudinous spiritual and supersensible type beings. And, uh, but these new science guys, they always want to talk about energy fields and they always leave, they always want to leave the beings out of the picture. And, and so it, it's, you can get caught up in this kind of yeah, well, detail and detail and deeper detail and all that and, and miss the forest for the trees that there's beings behind these phenomena and noumena. I was more interested in what you had to say on these propaganda elements. Uh, one of them was uh, memories not being stored or the mind that is not actually uh, in the body. Uh, science believes the mind is completely in the body. We can go on for hours on extrapolating this, but it was more important for what I heard from him and what I kind of fell upon in my own mind that uh, it's it breaks the concept of science, um, or, or even though he doesn't um, do a great job of talking about where does it get stored, he really dismantles the scientific method and the dogmas, almost like the you know the church dogmas that people just blindly believed in, and then based the reality on it. I love that quote or something he had in there about the Big Bang. We get one miracle and then everything else will figure out like the big bang was a miracle where everything got put in with all the permanent laws of science and matter never to be changed and energy even though we're expanding the universes no more energies ever in the universe that ever was but by their own definition that the universe is expanding there is more energy than there was so it's just a fallacy and science is is collapsing within its own dogmas and um, and so we're talking the steiner anthroposophical side of it uh where the mem where the memories really are stored but i just found it fascinating that this could really be the the bridge the key element to get people to sit, question say hey your memories and your thinking are not in your brain it's impossible it cannot be proved they cannot replicate it they can't prove that it science cannot prove that memories, where they're stored, how they're stored. You can't visually see the memories, recall them like you could under under this Mac, iMac I have here. Uh, and so therefore, first of all, it's not in your mind and your mind is not all in your body. And that leads us to the next step, which we can deliberate forever on. But the first thing is in our time is to get rid of this abstract thinking, which is erroneous. And it's almost as big as Copernicus, where you know we we're circling the sun, at least in the physical world, versus the sun circling us. And this is a really, I think, uh, uh, watershed moment that needs to be built on by a lot of anthroposophists and people of all different types of spiritual uh, interest to, to counter science to tear it right down. We're seeing the media, technology, government, religions, everything collapse. It's time science collapses with all of its lies. Yeah, and just to, to make it easier for people to find it, because it was a TED Talk that was uh, Chris Anderson censored uh, Rupert Sheldrake along with Graham Hancock and removed the, the video uh, from Ted's YouTube channel as they dared question scientific orthodoxy and they publicly castigated and attempted to defame them like like they don't know what they're talking about because they're not going along with the official narrative. That, that video is we should put a link in your YouTube for everyone. To yeah, watch. I can I can put that in. It's after. only it's only 18 minutes. It's short, but boy oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 like uh, uh, well, radio. basically, basically he presents his case. He 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 lays down a series of questions, and that's exactly uh, the approach that 
we took when we proved that the heart is not a pump and now it's become common knowledge amongst cardiology that the heart is is not a pump and uh, but that was based on research that we did we with uh, i did with uh, ralph marinelli the Rudolf steiner uh heart research center many years ago and we just set out to, to fulfill what Rudolf Steiner had said, that the heart is not a pump. And we proved structurally and uh, dynamically that it, it's impossible for the heart to be a pump. We proved yes. that that was the case exactly. and that there was this rotational movement of the heart that ejects the blood in a, a vortex. And, and I mean, it just, it's amazing well, again, how you, you, you get sucked into it. And if you look at the drawing of the heart, like in Gray's Anatomy, they cross-section it. But they cross-section it too high, so it makes the bottom of the heart look like it's real thick. But the bottom of the heart is just like a <clears throat> few layers of skin. It's a hinge. And if it was pressure, you'd get a blowout immediately. You know, So it's, it's so funny how people can buy into a narrative because it's accepted. And and that and that's one of the uh, ten elements of the propaganda questions he brings up in the video, is that the mechanistic model of the human being and of the universe as though it's a machine, and uh, again it's a fallacy. It's not a machine. What happens in our time, though, uh, people I can't even imagine hundreds of years ago, but people be people could become very afraid and fearful if the if the mask of false science, false medicine. Uh, that are not spiritualized with a different model of understanding. If there's no understanding, well, wait a second, then how does anything work? And how could you trust anything when you pull the carpet out from underneath science? And I told you something that came to me yesterday. It's just a thing that popped in my brain <laughs> or through into my brain through my etheric. But it was about if they, as science and medicine and technology start to lose their authority as they are, then they'll need another miracle like the Big Bang to try to basis themselves as still an authority figure. And I kind of said something crazy, but I'll say it here. I said aliens. So we're, you know, we're, we're all we're hearing about is aliens and aliens and aliens as they've been losing, the science has been losing its foothold, you know, and whether there is aliens or not, high technology through aliens is a good enough thing for science to say, we're the gatekeepers. We've, may get or may not get information and makes our mind wonder about higher technology from some genius miracle of the future and aliens and again they've positioned themselves if it wasn't between a, a god they removed the universe they'll position themselves between aliens we can't see like a god we couldn't see and say they're the authority figures either way science technology money all of it that whole thing wants to keep controlling our minds with false information. And, and I think that for me, that was the key. It's the lies and the energy it takes because it's it's intentional. They know they don't understand and they don't care, but they can't hold mankind back anymore. We've, we've crossed the Rubicon spiritually. Everybody knows everything is falling apart and they want to know how the heck does it all work? Where did it really all come from? What the heck's going on? And there's no religion or government or anything anymore to trust. So we're in a heck of a place right now, uh, humanity is. Yeah, basically, that's in the series of uh, challenges that, that Werner von Braun warned about back, way, way back. Back in, it would have been in the 60s or 70s, where he told his assistant, this woman, I can't think of her name right now, but uh, it was when he was at, he was uh, running Fairlight Industries, which is one of the uh, massive, uh, you know, secret project corporations out on the West Coast. And he said that what they were planning on doing. And they, he gave a whole series, you know, that there would be, you know, riots and then there would be, you know, terrorists and all this. And, and but the final thing was when they'd say that, you know, it's aliens. <laughs> We're going to be attacked by aliens. 
So it's like when you got somebody telling you that story and he's a top guy, former Nazi scientist who was head of uh, the NASA space program and used to see him on, on Disneyland and Disney, the Disney show, Walt Disney, he'd be on there talking with Walt. You know, it's like a Nazi, a Nazi. Yeah, a household figure, part of the uh, Operation Paperclip. But he he was an interesting character. When she she had to, he was supposed to give a talk, and he and he asked her. She had just started working for him, and he said, "Can you give the talk for me? Because you you know you're up up to steam on it." She said, "Well, no, really, I'm not." And he says, "Well, just don't worry, go out there." So she goes out there to do the talk. And she starts hearing his voice in her ear. And she did not have headphones on or anything. And he talked her through the whole presentation. And so I just want to, I guess I just, what I want to say is that they have a lot of things they haven't told you. <laughs> well, they'll, so, want to be the, they'll want to be the gatekeepers, though. And that's the whole power control but I, the humanity side, Rudolf Steiner says, medicine, science will become spiritualized in our century. It's going to become because it, 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 we're watching it fall apart right now. Not that we don't want science, but we want to have a holistic, complete understanding as best as possible of what we discover. Almost like, you know, Magellan or or uh Columbus crossing the ocean. We need to be able to discover, and they don't want that. They want to tell you, here's where it is. Here's what it is. Believe it. Take well, these they, decisions. Yeah, they want to make everything result of a material cause. See, and that's just not true. And until spiritual science becomes integrated into modern science, they're just going to keep going down the rosy path with all these theories that every anybody who goes to college knows you got to get a new textbook every year because it changes. These are theories. They're not uh, facts so much. I mean, there's facts embedded in the theories, but the theories are theories. Yeah. Or opinions. A, a or system words. that you can a system that you can invest in and that you can trust. And so what happens is after they get these ideas, or even global warming or all the other things, it's not under experimental anymore. It gets funded, financed, law gets put into place. In other words, they don't just bring information. Industry is being driven by things that have from pharmaceuticals with side effects to ecology to mining, every industry has got fallout and ramifications for humanity, but those are all pushed aside, So, and it gets pushed. So it's not only these ideas that stay in our head or in college, they're actually doing something to the earth and to our bodies and to our food intake and water supply, energy, et cetera, that has side effects, I'll just call it side effects, ramifications for the human being, for the soul, for the spirit, and that are not healthy and are not helpful. Yeah, I mean, uh, the more you look, the more detailed your your view becomes. And so the question is, is what can one do? And of course, all the years I've been doing this, I just checked this morning and I've done over 200, there's like 205 videos that I've done in this celebrated smallest channel on YouTube. <laughs> and that's okay, because this is for the people that like to get, dip their toes into the deeper water. And so it's not always easy to follow some of the things that we might say, because <clears throat> the abstract thinking that is utilized in scientism is as Rudolf Steiner describes it, it's a reaction to fear. And so it attempts to try and find closure amongst exclusively material causes. And when you do that, you're, you're missing out on the big picture because according to spiritual science, the big picture is way beyond just the material world, that there's the supersensible world 
which is the source of the material world. In fact, if you followed the material world back far enough, eventually you would find that it was spirit. That uh, it's, it's well, matter through a difference in time. Another thing is, uh, and here's how I look at what you do and, and uh, John does with you and others. Um, I consider this like almost like the beginning of Christianity or, or any religion, cult, or movement. Um, it's a, almost like yeast. You're looking, at the, I always say the smartest kids in the class are the fewest kids in the class. And in this case, it's not about smart. It's about interested in reality, interested in truth. So you'll never know how much transformation you've done in your videos, in your work, or just your thinking without even producing something in the subphysical world here and, and through the internet the change or transform or open that mind as though I, when I've got that idea about the memories in the brain, I picked it up somewhere. You brought a video that happened before it's out there in the ethers and somehow I was tuned to it. It's, it's given me something that says, Oh good. I can, cause I deal with the public and politics. You can go there and say, this is what's happening. What occurs is like yeast. Um, it's so many people awaken to possibilities they awaken to wondering which we love the, the wonders of the world and wondering and so that yeast let's just say there's ten thousand people on the planet maybe less that are having these are open to these concepts to the higher spiritual beings and they come in and they come into the being into the mind they're affecting the etheric realm in their local community they're affecting people that may hear one piece of something. Uh, this is how change and evolution occur. They don't occur through powerful 4 million views on YouTube with everyone watching the video or the music video or whatever, um, where the commoners get it because there's no transformation occurring there. There's only a buy-in of entertainment. Uh, but the thinking process needs wondering. And this wondering and questioning is something that you've done a, uh, affected a lot of the world. I've done it in a different realm, but this is how change and growth and evolution on the earth actually occur. So I, I always try to push people to tell them, don't think you're, you haven't done something. You may never be able to quantify it, but um, don't have low self-esteem with the value of what you're thinking, wondering, uh, because it is affecting the universe, the world, the cosmos. We are affecting much, much more than we could ever realize. Yeah, it's the pebble in the pond. I saw that pebble in there and the waves go all the way to the shore. And so you should never underestimate uh, the capability of the individual. And in fact, if you trace everything back, you'll find that everything leads back to some individual that did something. And then whatever that is, everything that followed after is an outpouring of that initial event. And that's and kind of like the story of Adam and Eve, right? It goes all the way back to the garden of Adam and Eve and, and the decision to be able to uh, enter into this realm. But, it was a deal with the devil, isn't it? You know, it's that, that fall of Lucifer, the serpent. And what happens is that the serpent makes you vulnerable to the dragon. And the dragon is Araman, and that's your material realm. Araman wants to destroy our relationship to the realms of soul and spirit. And in fact, he just wants to destroy everything and reduce it to, to a, a moon, so to speak, uh, inert physical object and and lucifer says this isn't worth it let's get out of here and he just wants to leave the material world unfinished and the christ impulse as it's presented by rudolf steiner is to be able to find the balance point between those two uh divergent paths uh, that are unwholesome and and you'll see people you could see the harmonic principle working in them unconsciously and their personality is very luciferic, or you could see them having an harmonic cold personality and the luciferic 
is an inner uh, aspect of their nature. And, and also within cultural streams, you see that, that authoritarian uh, reach uh, wanting to dominate. And, and that's not what we're looking at when it comes to understanding the Christ impulse, because the, the true purest uh, Christ impulse is that Michaelic impulse of freedom. And to be able to have the freedom to come Christ out of your own being. And Rudolf Steiner makes the point, and I keep making this point again and again, because it's it really is the point. But the the ideas of humility and wonder, awe, and reverence that Joe and I and Douglas and everybody we keep making reference to because that's kind of the the meme that that can represent to you the, the mood of soul. And it's that mood of soul. And if you can consecrate your life, then then what you do is you enable yourself to be able to enter into uh, a, a sacral or a sacred relationship. I'm going to read a brief quote of Rudolf Steiner's from the uh, lecture from July 8, 1904, Sacramentalism, Daedalus and Icarus. He says, the essence of sacramentalism is that the human being fills everyday things with a sacred spiritual quality. The sense and point of the ancient legends was to bring about the right vibration in people's souls so that they were filled with spiritual strength. Through this, the simplest action of a naive heart can be hallowed. We could try as hard as we like to bring harmony and order to the physical plane, but it will fail as long as we work only on the physical plane. Harmony created on the one side gives rise to disharmony on the other. But if you let the spiritual operate, you will see that everyday matters are approached in a completely different way. This is sacramentalism. Yeah, I read that one. Uh, that was really that was really a moving before I went on the show, and I started thinking about the uh, the the reverence, the wonder, and all. And just think about wonder. When you wonder, we all kind of like look up. I wonder. You lift your eyes as part of that lifting your eyes to the superconscious. Immediately, you're opening up your being as you start to wonder. You're opening it up. It's almost like the vessel, the flower. Uh, when you have reverence, you're looking at something in, in a humility or in a feeling of almost with the awe of uh, we've all done it in our life during our daily processes. We don't really realize what we're doing to the heart and the eyes and the, and our which connected to our spiritual being. And we're in a different state than we are when we are pushing redundant abstract thoughts uh, going along, plodding along in our daily life, doing what we don't want to do. Our whole approach to to the simple task that, that you just read about have to come. And you find this in your acting training. Um, a lot of the methods of acting talk about this in a different light, but where you pick up a cup, or let's just say I have a bottle of water here, and I'm going to use a demonstration, and Chekhov does this, Denislavsky, and he'll take, he'll take this, and every time you drink from it, You'll, you have to do this as training. A hundred different ways do I drink this water. And what it does is it a hell, heck of a technique. And you could say it's spiritual training because you start to become conscious of all the different ways and methods of the same thing. And you find within there a refreshing and a rejuvenation that doesn't happen if you do the harmonic principle of over and over like a rut, like a railroad track in your mind, like an over and over thing. So the rejuvenation comes from dexterity, from doing the same thing with a different outlook and perspective. Um, and so that life doesn't become dull and not interesting, which is happening to people definitely in midlife. And then we'll turn to affairs in their marriage drugs, alcohol, whatever, to try to rejuvenate in a, in, a, in a darker force path. But all in all, it really is that ability um, to be with children, 
And you find that with little kids. Just go in the room with young kids. If you haven't been around young kids and you're older, you won't like it for a couple minutes. Like, hey, what's all this noise? Calm down. It's chaos. It's energy. It's life. I said, my girlfriend's got a 12-year-old daughter and all her friends. And I'm like, I'm not used to it. My daughter was her age 20 years ago. It's like, whoa. And all of a sudden, I start getting a chuckle. And I watch and I look. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm getting old. Look at the kids. They're having fun. They're full of spontaneity and life and enthusiasm that you, we all tend to lose as we get older. So you can do it yourself. You can do it with those around you. But it's the joy of life. Really, it is the joy of life. Well, it brings to mind Rudolf Steiner's statement. There are no insignificant moments, right? And nobody knows that better than a, a little kid. I mean if it isn't going their way, they're going to start crying or whatever. They definitely are in tune with the track of time. And the challenge is when you get older, you tend to kind of damp down the life of feeling. And it can become uh, like life can become like you're watching black and white television, really. And it, although I have to admit that doesn't happen to me, but I'm, thoroughly engaged. There's not enough hours in the day for me to be able to explore all the various avenues that I wish to pursue. And But going back to our theme, you have to keep in mind that, that uh, Rudolf Steiner makes the point again and again, but I, I, I don't see that other people necessarily realize the importance. But when one goes to sleep, your astral body and your ego leave your etheric body and your physical body on the bed. And if you've been living within the inspiration of the Christ impulse, then that will be what you have as an experience when you cross the threshold. Now, you probably won't remember, uh, but eventually you will, uh, is the way the story goes. And so... I would much rather do that than watch some horrible uh, movie with a bunch of guys shooting each other, and that's the last thing you do before you go to sleep. That's not good food for, for your dreams. And so if we can be attentive to our consciousness and have a sense of responsibility and, and that you're determined and, and you can humbly uh, approach sleep uh, and bring to it, like uh, reading the first 14 verses of the Gospel of John or reciting the Lord's Prayer, just to consciously enter into the spiritual world. Because Rudolf Steiner says that if you don't do that in your waking life, it won't happen while you're asleep. And so the, the, the future stage of transformation that mankind is destined to evolve to, for it to happen in a wholesome way, it's up to the individual to take up the challenge. Yeah, and and this is what the show is about, is grail language. And some people would say, well, what, what is grail language? What, what does that mean? Um, was there something that the King Arthur, <laughs> and they spoke in a different tongue or a different language? Actually, what is the grail language? Is it spoken? Is it heard? Is it lived? Um, is it sign language? And um, and so I find I find it very interesting with the wondering. Um, I, I really go back to wondering. It's it's really the rudiment to just about every problem, struggle, challenge you may have, or even wanting to understand something, to wonder. I wonder. We don't know how we open ourselves up to the spiritual world once we wonder. Uh, even a mundane life task, it doesn't have to be things that are of what we would think spiritual. Just even the mundane, the processes that are occurring, the communication, because it's a two-way street. The grail language is, is both ways. It's not just us. So we're communicating as we read the Bible, as we read holy works, as we read anthroposophy, study try to discover the the understanding the attempt the spiritual activity to attempt to understand by itself 
that whole configuration of the mind, heart, soul, and the will forces to try and seek um, is really the beginning of of everything. It, 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 and we forget, I'm just interested like John is, but many people aren't that interested in the world behind the world or what makes this happen. And in our time, I believe more people are going to be the got to be questioning as they see civilization and all they ever knew of, of a country or a world just collapsing with hypocrisy double standards uh, while everything is visible the questioning power of what what uh, and what i find is people are looking for some outward authority to come in save correct and it doesn't exist we happen to be living in a time where it's up to each person you want to talk about the grail each person is a knight each person has the quest in search of the grail and again it's that seeking uh for the truth and this the long suffering that we all are feeling right now because people are feeling it i don't care what your political beliefs or what country you live in we're feeling that something's wrong where are we going next what's happening with all the nuclear bombs in the world and militaries and everything and courthouses and all the whole bit why is there such chaos what's really happening in the world so there's a constant sense of wonder i believe if you look in uh all the scriptures of all the lands you'll see that they're written in a picture language and Rudolf Steiner says that what mankind in this current time period, this consciousness soul period, where it's our challenge to be able to take the consciousness soul and transform it into the spiritual soul in preparation for the spirit self, which is basically entering into a, a direct relationship with one's holy guardian angel as it would be described within the christian tradition and so when you look at that and you say well what is that and and if you look into scripture you see that by being expressed in picture language it gives you freedom and and it allows for levels and levels of an interpretation because according to uh, the esoteric tradition there each as Madame Blavatsky once said all all esoteric uh, writings have seven levels of interpretation and so that gets into a whole developed story that I explain in my second book the arcana of light on the path the seven great mysteries or as Blavatsky called them the seven unutterable secrets and uh, but in my first book, uh, there's a, a nice little aside that I quote from Parsifal by Wolfram von Eschenbach that was written around 1198 A.D. And this is in Book Nine, uh, Passage 454. The heathen Phlegitanus could tell us how all the stars set and rise again, and how long each one revolves before it reaches its starting point once more. To the th circling course of the stars, man's affairs and destiny are linked. Phlegitanus, the heathen, saw with his own eyes in the constellations the things he was shy to talk about, hidden mysteries. He said there was a thing called the Grail, whose name he had read clearly in the constellations. A host of angels left it on the earth and then flew up away over the stars. Was it their innocence that drew them away? Since then, baptized men have had the task of guarding it. And with such chaste discipline that those who are called to the service of the grail are always noble men. Thus wrote Phlegitanus of these things. So you see that there's a, a, a certain criteria that he's pointing at there, that, that it's not this wild and woolly thing that, that we're seeing expressed all around us culturally with 
all kinds of exaggerated sensuality uh, that, that wants to draw you so far into the realm of the senses that you go into granulation and that you'll end up being part of a cast off moon if you keep going down that path. <laughs> I mean, I, I hate to be the one to break it to you, but <laughs> that's just not really uh, an ideal way to go. Now, it, there is a balance point, you know, and if you get into, uh, let's see if I can get some light on this here. Uh, on, the, on the Aesthetic Education of Man by Friedrich Schiller good buddy of Goethe, and he talks about that equilibrium. And I think we're going to have to do an episode that that articulates that because it's so beautifully placed and it played such a big role. It's a series of some, what, 27 letters that he wrote. And uh, in understanding the balance between the head and the heart and the strivings therein. But uh, as I didn't uh, even think to bring that up to Joe, it wouldn't be fair to throw him in the, such deep literary waters. <laughs> but that being said, if you're interested in pursuing this further, you can follow along in our adventures. Also, I've been doing shows again with, with uh, Douglas Gabriel. I did one just yesterday. and Actually, I'm going to do another one tomorrow from what I hear. And with Joe and, well, hopefully soon get the three of us together again. So we're going to be trying to give people concepts to help them be able to uh, deconstruct this uh, materium, you know, that, that you have this whole worldview that you're being given that's incomplete to solve the mystery in which we live. And if you disagree with me, okay, I challenge you to find me wrong. Uh, take those uh, points that are made by Rupert Sheldrake. See if you can answer them. Or go to the 350-some volumes of Rudolf Steiner and find try and find an inconsistency. I've been at it for some 50 years or something thereabouts, and I can assure you that his work is entirely internally consistent. So he's obviously just not making it up as he goes along, that he's actually engaged in the perceptions, just as he says. <clears throat> and I'm glad you mentioned the picture language, because let's say we're going to wonder about something. What's the first thing we do? We have an image. Sometimes we don't even know we have it in our mind. Uh, let's see, my, my hose on my truck broke the other day, all right? I see a leak and I see an image. These are just mechanical things in life. And I look and I see Presto when I get out of the car. Oh no, I got a leak. Is it the radiator? Is it this? It's just regular stuff. And I wonder what it is. And so just in the mechanical world, I wonder if the things I know, could it be the radiator hose? Could it be the water pump? Could it be the radiator? Could the engine have blown? All these things, and we know about them, but with wondering spiritually, we don't know about the things that Rudolf Steiner speaks about, why it's so important to, uh, to gather as much information and language about this world, even if we don't totally comprehend the meaning of each thing. The etheric body, if you first heard of it, I have, I don't know, 40, 45 years ago, what's that? That word, etheric body, image, has changed over 40 years. It's become fulfilled and different than at first, but not the engine of the radiator of my truck. Those are the same. But what I'm getting at is the imagery of I wonder what it is and I know things. But when you open your heart to wonder about something that's happening in society that you don't have all the answers to, you're not a neuroscientist, you're not a, you know, a judge, you know, all these different spheres, you can get hoodwinked by all these authorities, but you still wonder uh, and you're looking for answers. Um, but in spiritual science, the answers can come from plethora of places and worlds. And it can be very scary and daunting for people that are looking. But we are putting an image in our mind when we say, I wonder. And I wondered about, and I got an answer later on the brain that I just did myself. How are memory stored? Wait a second. Rudolf Steiner speaks about this small disks 
in the etheric body were our memories. And so I knew that for decades, but I never thought of, well, wait a second, they are saying brain, I ran across something. It's not in the brain, but I never stopped to do what I did a few weeks ago to say, the brain couldn't. Why did I ever think about this? And that's how this whole thing is uh, with anthroposophy or anything. It's We may not have the perspective or the moment when we wonder correctly because however your own personal development goes, it's unique. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, <laughs> like the Italian religion. It's your one-on-one, you know, with you and him or you and this information. So all the answers can't be given by our groups or our speaking or YouTubes, but we try to put something out so maybe when people are looking for something, they find it. Well, Rudolf Steiner describes uh, Christ as the new Lord of Karma since he came, went through the mystery of Golgotha. And how can he be the new Lord of Karma unless he's not custodian of all the memories? Okay, so when, when you come to think it through in spiritual science, you realize that all your memories are being held in the Akashic record and the one in charge is, is the, that great being we call Christ. And so, which is interesting because, you know, you could be uh, a baby in your mother's arms when you were like uh, three months old and they're riding in the car and she's holding you in a swaddling blanket and you happen to see a road sign while you're an infant and you can't even read, right? Well were you to undergo hypnosis and i'm not recommending hypnosis because it's not a wholesome thing but were you to undergo hypnosis you'd be able to uh read that sign from when you were an infant in your mother's arms so it's somewhere in there in your yeah. memories yeah so it's not just the things you're conscious of but all this right all the stuff right. that you didn't even pay attention to is in there also yeah. and and the n amount of uh Geez, gigabytes doesn't even describe the amount of storage you'd need. Right, right. So that you could just like uh, take thoughts and, and, and bring them to a, a deeper level and these things fall apart. You know, the, like if you look at the, at the climate thing, well, that goes back to Enron. That's where that idea originated. That was their strategy with what they were doing with uh, natural gas manipulation uh, and all that whole scam that they ran back then and they, and went to jail and you know so <clears throat> so we have people are not nice we have a question on the screen here yeah so uh spx fabian asks uh, hello question if one is aware of the nature of the adversarial forces do the adversarial forces tend to leave one alone or do they still try to find ways to create resistance to one's evolution good question um they're a necessary part of the equation. They just don't, you should give them a right to enter in and work in you as a soul force. Hold Lucifer back in his realm and hold Armon in his realm because thanks to Armon, you have a, you know, a skeleton, for example. It's actually the whole idea that we've been able to manifest in this realm is a result of that. And, and you look at uh, St. Peter's, when he was complaining to our Lord and Christ turned to him and said, get thee behind me, Satan. He didn't like try to destroy Satan. He just knocked him back where he belongs. And so it, it, it has to do with having custodialship on your realm, that you're in charge and you have to keep them back because all of evolution has come into being as a result of opposition. And so there are, there are always going to be opposing forces. It's just what kind of a role do they play in your being? How conscientious are you to keep them at bay? I'll give you a couple of statements on what Rudolf Steiner speaks about. If we ever ran into Araman, uh, he says to cross the street and tip your hat. You can't engage with him because you would be crushed the genius the, uh, is, is so high for a human being, they couldn't cope with it. So uh, that doesn't, that's just one perspective. Another 
uh, perspective is that um, these forces, uh, he says another statement, Rudolf Steiner, the, uh, when it comes to some of their powers or activities, he's, and uh, especially with Sarat and, um, and the Azuras, he says the, um, the knowledge and understanding that they exist in some cases are our only protection. Uh, but they're existing right now within us. All things are within each human being. Um, but like the three temptations of Christ, there are things that you can do to bring them into balance. And John was speaking about that. When you get the cold, sclerotic, let's just say we're in a movie script here, and there's this guy who's just really mean. He wants to kill, crush, destroy, greedy, money, short, bony, uh, calcifying. This is Armin. Uh, luciferic, dramatic, colorful, um, um, what do you call it, well, tumoring, uh, muscle growth, blood, that is Lucifer. And so you get the color, the life over and over a, mod a modulation, um, like TV commercials, when they come on, they get really loud. Well, that's what Lucifer does. He gets really colorful, really loud. So bringing uh, thinking that's more our feeling uh, when you want to counter the RMI principle, getting cold and calculating. If you get too crazy emotional, get more cold, ground yourself. So if, once you understand how these forces, these beings manifest, and they're here, as John said, to create reality, uh, help create reality, then when you're encountering a problem or an issue or anything, you when you know their principles, then you can bring the counter forces in and employ them to balance yourself in your thinking, in your feeling, in your willing. So they're not adversaries. And I, I, the last thing Steiner says that I remember that's important here would be in their domain, Lucifer and Armin, in their domain, when they do the work in their domain, they're benevolent. When they move outside their sphere, the malevolent. And so again, it's up to you at that malevolence point to balance them. Absolutely, and and just for anybody who's out there, Araman is like what people refer to as Satan. So the spirit of materialism, just as Lucifer is that spirit of immateriality and egoism, uh, the, the greed is the uh, Aramonic. And so in looking at these things, uh, it gives you an empowerment because don't forget, Christ is infinitely more powerful than the adversaries. Yes. And so one needn't uh, really be worried about these things. People tend to get a little obsessive because they watch too much television. Yeah. yeah. I guess. Well, oh, that's what the Christ, the Christ power is, the balancing power. Yeah. He's the human being. He's there, the gentle movement, that voice in your head. So you're a guardian angel, the, that whisper that, you know, when you hear it once, it's always present, but we're allowed. It's where people, why would God allow this to happen? The, you know, the old, why would God, but the, which makes it appear to the God is missing in action or weak. It's up to us to become an art evolution period right now to become conscious of these things, which we have the capabilities in a development to become conscious. And that's what the conscious and soul aspect is. And, uh, and it happens through industry. So Rudolf Steiner speaks to you about if it wasn't for Christ, you'd have no industry. Things you would never consider religious <laughs> or having to do with Christ would 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 uh, make many people go, wait a second. But I thought it was Sunday, no business, no activity. That's not where he's found. He's found in productivity, in human life. And yet we're being told so many things um, because he does, Christ does not have in our time the proper I guess I would say church or the proper uh, uh, cult, whatever you want. It doesn't have a PR agency right now. And the one he had <laughs> through the churches for hundreds of years was pretty, pretty bad. Uh, so we're now all of us looking to um, realize that the human form, the human being, the I, the ego um, is right here. And these other forces are, are uh, when they're benevolent, they're here to, be helpful, uh, and this is why Christ, in the in the image of the group, is reaching up and reaching down towards Lucifer and Araman, 
through love. And that's the key. Is the last thing I'd ever say is it's love. And that word is so misused and misunderstood, but it is the power of love. Absolutely. And uh, I, I don't want to forget to uh, thank some wonderful people. And uh, this pos podcast has been made possible through the generous support of Tyler and Douglas and Vadim and Vivian and Jenna and Neil and Lee and Ray and Whitney and James and Marilyn. And there's a lot of other people. If I didn't mention you, uh, I love you too. And, uh, but uh, in keeping in mind the, the way one looks at it from uh, a crystal centric view, shall we say, uh, I keep quoting this recently, but because it, it's very important. He says that, uh, let's see, human beings ruin Christianity through their intellect. As well as this, there are terribly dilettante institutions that have been set up in recent times at universities. Originally, there were four traditional faculties, namely philosophy, theology, jurisprudence, and medicine. The rest have been added, have been based on utter unenlightenment and misunderstanding. Faculties for such subjects as political science, national economy, and the like originated from thoughts which no longer knew anything at all of the essentials. What has not been understood at all is that to begin with, Four men were sent out by Christ to proclaim Christianity. Matthew, the theologian. Mark, the jurist. Luke, the physician. And John, the philosopher. This fact, which has very deep roots in the spiritual life. Things at present that are only in germ and have yet to blossom and bear fruit. Is also connected with the realization that the text of the four gospels cannot completely tally because the one is written from the standpoint of, and it goes into the four different uh, views, but uh, that is a very much important to understand that you have this archetypal relationship to what's described in the Christian tradition as the tetramorph, which is the four fourfold uh, images of the gospel so that you have the the bull is luke and the lion is mark and the eagle is john and then matthew is a man or an angel and you see these over the cathedrals and in many depictions and and uh paintings and and all of that and you say well what is that well going back to what i was reading earlier from parsifal where it's talking about, he's talking about reading in the stars and that it's that we have this expanded cosmic relationship. As you open yourself to your higher levels of being, they're not within you. <laughs> You're going to find your higher being surrounds you. And Rudolf Steiner's very adamant about that. He says, if you go, like everybody always says in meditation, go deep within. Well, You'll, you can find your personal karma, that's true. But if you really want to expand into these future states of consciousness where you come into relationship directly with your higher ego that is in perfect harmony with Christ and his mission, but it's up to us to be able to take our personality and engage it in this whole really symphony of being that is being offered to us through Christ, but he's patiently waiting that we take up this task out of perfect freedom. And so uh, I want to thank everybody for coming along. And if you want to contribute to this endeavor, that's paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888, just like it says here on the screen. And uh, I'm the author of two books, The Arcana of Grail Angel, which is currently out of print. It's got a, a forward by Douglas Gabriel, 640 pages. And, uh, but I'm trying to get that reprinted. 
But in the meantime, I still have copies of my second book, The Arcana of Light on the Path, with a forward by William Bento. And it's loaded with all these uh, grail diagrams, as I call them. Both books have them. And uh, so that will help guide you in this path of cosmic wisdom that has been laid out by Rudolf Steiner and is coming directly out of the tradition of the school of Dionysius the Areopagite, who is the first bishop of Athens as accounted in the gospels. And so I want to thank everybody for showing up and I especially want to thank Joe and the wonderful job he's doing wrestling with political dragons. <laughs> He, I, I could never do that. I, I, maybe when I was younger, but uh, that's that sport is for a, a younger man, I think. And uh, but I want to thank you all very much for showing up. And uh, oh, there was one more question about the. Uh, I was wondering what your thoughts are regarding Templar versus Teutonic Knights. Well, that brings up a whole big question that we'll have to deal with in a later episode to, to do it justice. But just in terms of, of orders, remember, there's many benevolent institutions. And then because the adversarial powers are not creative, what they do is they go and they, they're like uh, homesteaders. Parasites. They're homesteaders. They just go in and they like steal uh, their way into institutions. And before you know it, what was once good is no longer in service of its original uh, intention. And speaking of the devil, uh, <laughs> there's a robocaller. <laughs> and so I never pick up my phone unless I know who it is. And so that's who's out there. And so just because there's an institution that has the name of something that was venerable, that doesn't mean the people running it today are venerable. But yet you have this whole tradition with these esoteric symbols that are used in these organizations that work in you unconsciously. But if you study anthroposophy, if you study spiritual science or Rudolf Steiner, that's the antidote to all of that uh, unconscious program. Because you want these things to be conscious. You don't want them to work in you unconsciously. Because then you're vulnerable. And why be vulnerable? Why not find that you have the the armor of God, and you can make the proclamation that you have the armor of God and that that will work. I'd like to say one thing before we close, and it's about the guardian angel. It's not just a guardian to protect, but it's a guide. Um, and we have to look at our guardian angel, think about our guardian angel and what's happening. It, it sets up meetings with people you're going to meet in the future. We should do a show on that. But it's much, much more important for us to understand what, beyond the devil and all these things we were speaking about, just how much guidance and protection um, and uh, for our karma, because this is what the dark forces do not want us to believe in or understand or even have, and that is our karma, why we're here, what we came for, and also what is not our karma, to build new things for the future. They're against that, and but we have so many forces and powers and spiritual beings with us and the spiritual world that wants to come through to help our new world um, that uh, we should do a show on the guardian angel. That sounds good. Okay, well, I want to thank everybody, and please click like. I, I've heard that that's a good idea, and so we'll see you uh, next time around. Yeah. <laughs>